The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Amid hundreds of outstanding land claims and calls for greater self-determination, there's a growing understanding that reconciliation includes returning land to Indigenous peoples. What does that look like? Well, tonight we're going to get three perspectives. First, the Federal Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations, Mark Miller. He explains what his government means when it talks about land back. Then, how is that being received by First Nations here in Ontario? And from a legal point of view, how would it work? It's Monday, March 28th, and that's all next on The Agenda. Shortly after he was sworn in as the new Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations last October, Mark Miller caught the attention of many people with a few simple but highly significant words. Quote, land theft and land back. Now, a few months into his tenure, we wanted to find out where he sees it all going. Mark Miller is the Liberal MP for Ville-Marie, le Sud-Ouest, Ile des Sœurs in Quebec. And he joins us now from the nation's capital. And Minister, it's great to have you back on our program. How are you doing? Good. Thank you for having me on. It's our pleasure. Let me just set up our conversation with this that was reported in the Toronto Star last December, and it will set up the questions to come. In his first comments in the new role this fall, Miller turned heads when he stated that it's time to give land back to Indigenous peoples. It was an invocation of an established goal of Indigenous activists pressing to reverse the damaging impacts of colonialism in this country, one of the core aims of Idle No More and other movements since. And it was a statement with potential relevance to Indigenous nations across Canada, from the Wet'suwet'en opposing a pipeline project in northern BC to the people of Attawapiskat who are hoping to acquire new land for housing in their community. Can you tell us, for starters then, what exactly those words mean to you? Land back. Well, Steve, this, this is as much about what the federal government should be doing as it is about framing the conversation, land dispossession, land theft, land fraud has occurred since the 16th century. Uh, and it, it goes to the basis of our relationship with indigenous peoples. Um, it was embodied and acknowledged in the Royal Proclamation of 1763. And um, if you look at the number of treaties or the treaties that we signed with indigenous peoples and not respected, it is at the core of that discussion. It's a spiritual discussion, it's a legal discussion. And it is one that um, that has framed a lot of the issues that we face today when we're trying to deal with issues that may seem far removed, uh, residential schools, uh, water. Um, it is at the core of, of economic development. So the first step is acknowledging it, acknowledging the federal government's role in, uh, in, in, in the state of the reality that we face today as a country and the land that people like me live on, but also about what we need as, as and, and you, you acknowledged it a few seconds ago about um, not only activists, but uh, indigenous leadership time and time again, saying we can't talk about self development, self government without talking about the land base. Okay, um, you've acknowledged it. That's a big step. And I, I want to give you what I'm sure you've already heard as some of the feedback to uh, that rather extraordinary statement that you made. Uh, Courtney Skye, who's a research fellow at the Yellowhead Institute, Six Nations of the Grand River, 90 minutes from the studio, said, as a Haudenosaunee person, I'm highly skeptical because I've seen the promises they make and then I've seen the moves the Liberals make behind closed doors. I think it's more just Liberal promises that don't have the meat behind them. And there's another headline from ABTN's Nation to Nation, Miller's vow to give land back, all sizzle, no steak, question mark. Okay, that skepticism is there. How do you want to address it? Well, I think we have to acknowledge that it exists first and foremost, that skepticism. And, you know, we've, ta we've asked time, time and time again for Indigenous peoples to trust us and have not delivered. This is a, as much about us acknowledging the reality of the situation, which is highly complex. The, the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples highlighted the, the challenge we face, for example, our own crown relationship with provinces where the choice pieces of land lie within what we call, quote unquote, the provincial crown, 90% uh, of it in BC, for example, um, and the relationship we need to have with Indigenous peoples and bring the provinces and territories along in ensuring that the solutions we have for restitution and reparation include not only financial compensation where adequate and appropriate, 
but also the restitution of land um, as part of uh, the reparations discussion that we need to have. These are difficult discussions. They're not easy discussions. Uh, I'm not asking anyone, nor should anyone implicitly trust me as a result, but they have to see uh, the willingness and the ability of the government to deliver it. But that does take a number of conversations with the private sector, with provinces and territories, uh, various institutions within um, within the federal government but some of the some of the solutions have been there for a long time and i hate and i hesitate to point fingers at other third parties without looking inwards the additions to reserve policy that my own department has administered has been slow uh, at the best of times and the solutions that we've offered to communities as part of our discussions um, can't be a one-size-fits-all approach it has to be reflective of conversations settlements usually hopefully outside of court um, and then where land is not available for example uh, the, 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 the adequate compensation thereof. And that is also um, a set of conversations that we need to have because too often communities have felt like they're being slow played. Um, those are conversations that we bring to the table um, and, and have to have open and honestly with, with leadership foremost. Um, they have been, as you've acknowledged, at the, at the center of, um, of disputes in Six Nations um, or in Wet'suwet'en territory, and they are still there and they are not going to go away uh, anytime soon. So I think therein lies um, skepticism. But um, extending an open hand and saying we're willing to talk about it and we're willing to have creative discussions around it, I think helps in in, um, in, in, in in clearing a bit of the air, but also more importantly, moving forward and achieving what we said we want to achieve. Okay, I appreciate your position on that. And I, I guess I should say, I can also appreciate the fact that you don't want to negotiate with me here on television. Uh, you want to negotiate with the people who are actually at the heart of this thing. Having said that, I'm going to be a bit of their mouthpiece for the moment in as much as there's a housing crisis in Ottawa, in Attawapiskat. And I suspect if they were here, they would like me to try to get you to make as firm a commitment as you possibly think you can right now in saying, when can they look forward to an expansion of their ter territory on your watch? And Steve, these are on, these are discussions that both Minister and Haidu and I have that are ongoing with the the community. Um, again, I I would not air them on in, in the public domain, um, and it's something that uh, we acknowledged at least publicly with them as when we met them on the grounds of Parliament Hill a few months ago, uh, and and and. That is the reality of what they are requiring in a number of other situations that um, that, that aren't limited to Attawapiska, but it's something that we will do um, in fairness and out of respect for the community outside the public eye. When you talk about land back, does it have to go hand in hand with self-determination? In other words, can't do one without the other? Well, it's really a question of, of working at the rhythm of a community in, in question. Um, it is... You know, it's easy to stand on the floor of the House of Commons and talk about rights recognition and self-determination. It's quite another one to go in a community and say, let's talk about this framework that we've cooked up in our own heads and now we want to impose on you. And the community turns around and says, well, you haven't worked with us on roads, you haven't worked with us on hospitals, education, new schools, uh, which is at the heart of some of the discussions we've had on residential schools and the legacy of that. Um, so recognizing that there are priorities and that we have to work at the pace of communities. I know that sounds to a lot of people like like slow playing and it sounds like we're delaying things, but it's fundamentally about respect and to listening to the other side. Um, the rights recognition framework that we've put together works in certain situations. It doesn't in others. Um, for example, in some number treaty areas, um, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples provides a set of, of, uh, of, of guidelines or of principles, but they're... Um, they're, put in, they're putting into place in a very practical reality is one that has to be done in partnership with the communities, in partnership with the leadership. And um, that, that is um, something that is painstaking. It takes a lot of time, but it's actually the right way and it's the respectful way. It's what we've heard time and time again from communities, even in a coming out of a two-year pandemic where people have been focused on keeping their own just simply alive. Let's do a little Crown Indigenous Relations 101 here. I know that if Canadians were to take an old Rand McNally atlas out and they looked across the country, they would see numerous references to unceded land or unceded territory. Tell us what your understanding of that means. Yes, and there's been a lot, particularly in and around um, land acknowledgements, there's been a lot of question and head scratching in and around what constitutes ceded and unceded land. It goes um, to our own understanding of uh, the number of treaties that were 
signed um, through Ontario and throughout going throughout the West, um, as well as lands that were actually never subject to treaty, uh, principally in the West, or have not been necessarily acknowledged as treaties as such, which probably should be in the East. So it, it varies wildly depending on what part of the country you're talking about, where I come from, um, there are long acknowledged treaties of, of friendship and peace that are embodied sometimes in a non way through, um, through wampum belts. They have not been recognized by the crown and they are ones that uh, are very sacred and, and, and legal in nature for the communities. Um, the Haudenosaunee that you mentioned, for example, are one of them. Um, that's a process that is highly complex um, it, I understand that for a lot of people it can be bewildering, but again, it goes to my, I think the point I made earlier in a different context that we can't have a one size fits all approach because whatever the relationship and however it's been embodied, um, there's been some egregious behavior by the Crown um, and it's important to acknowledge it. And, you know, Canadians that are sitting that aren't, uh, you know, perhaps watching your show that aren't um, seized every day by Indigenous issues um, can, be, can, can be easily confused, but I think there's a lot of eagerness to to raise awareness and to raise awareness of the role and the benefits that we all have as Canadian citizens and how that has perhaps affected Indigenous communities and grounds um, a lot of the legitimate claims that we hear today and um, that as an outsider you can sometimes find um, confusing. But uh, over the last two years I've certainly sent, felt a sense and I've seen it at the doors, um, a need and a, and a thirst of people to recognize that the relationship we've had with Indigenous peoples is torn and the expectation from all levels of government that that needs to be fixed in a way that perhaps is not yet well understood, but people want it to happen. I'm glad to be part of a government that started doing it. Well, I guess I asked the question because I guess in some respects this adds to the complication of your job because if you're talking about giving back quote unquote unceded territory that Indigenous peoples never considered to be Canadian territory to begin with, how exactly are you, quote unquote, giving land back that was never yours in the first place? Yeah, you, know, you know, it's 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 the intellectual hypocrisy that we all bathe in uh, as as a country at times. Insofar as these are lands that have been occupied, they now have third parties on it, uh, non-Indigenous people. They have had equally Indigenous peoples that have been moved from their uh, ancestral lands that were never actually ceded. And, and I think whether you're talking about uh, the landmark Supreme Court case a quarter century ago um, related to the Wet'suwet'en, uh, whether you are talking about more recent cases related to the Chilcotin, again out West, um, these are important breakthroughs in actually acknowledging what went on and that we have often, um, as non-Indigenous peoples, forgotten. Be it as it may, uh, the reality is is that Canada looks the way it looks today, and insofar as lands cannot be restituted, or if it is impossible and communities prefer compensation, that's something we also have to move quickly on because what we're doing is holding things back. A lot of people look, look at Indigenous communities and say, well, there's a lot of socioeconomic gaps. Well, those socioeconomic gaps are rooted in land theft, they're rooted in dispossession, they're rooted in displacement, and when you add up you know, those three or four factors and lag on and top on that residential schools, you're starting to trace a pattern of, of, of people that have very legitimate claims and must be recognized as such. Um, and part of that, and the part of that disentangling um, can't be done by, uh, by slicing through the so-called Gordian knot. You have to actually uh, carefully untangle that respectfully with communities. We've got a few minutes to go here, and I just want to see if I can touch on a couple of more things. Let me share these numbers with you, and if if, if you think I've got them wrong, by all means correct me, but I think this, the state of affairs in Canada today is such that 11% of land in the country is privately owned, 41% is federal crown land, 48% is provincial crown land, and 0.36% is set aside as reserve status. So you're kind of in charge of, of a lot. Can you not just unilaterally decide, I'm in charge of 41% of the land in this country, here you go. Yeah, well, it, 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 um, it's an interesting, it's an interesting uh, question or statement for, to have me react to. When it comes to the, the federal crown land, um, I think people will acknowledge those are not necessarily always what would be considered as the choice pieces um, in, in and around where people would want their their land back. A lot of the, the ones that are closer to urban centers are in fact uh, provincial crown land. 
Um, but to the so there's a complexity there in one part. Uh, but when it comes to the the crux of your of, of the premise you asked me to work with, um, these these are discussions that do not necessarily fall within the Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations authorities. My ability to I think if people had the power that you think I could have, I'd be a much more dangerous person than I am today. <laughs> um, but it, it, it does take work with communities to see what is needed. When you know, a simple example, for example, is, is some of the lands that the Minister of Defense holds as part of uh, some of their portfolio, or, or whatever has um, been held by uh, by public procurement. Those are all issues that have to be worked inside within government with people at the table. Um, there's some willingness that said. Um, but I think it's a lot more complex than, uh, than saying there's 43% of the Crown land that's federal and we can just uh, give it back to X, Y, or Z communities because there are, what we are talking about when we engage with communities is specific areas, specific claims. And often you'll find in the most complex claims, um, for example, in my, in my neck of the woods, which were um, designated to uh, religious orders on behalf of Louis, uh, by Louis XIV or Louis XV, who was, seven-year-old child for some reason decided that this should go to Sulpicians um, in the north of Montreal. When it comes to Ganesatage, these are these are issues that go back uh, many centuries and are now occupied by people who no one is, for any particular reason is asking to leave, um, but does make the claims uh, less legitimate as a result. But again, this all takes work sitting down and there are often no simplistic answers. But when I say that, I also recognize that we can't use complexity to slow things down. Well, for this idea of land back to work, I wonder whether in some densely populated parts of the country, some people are going to have to give up their homes or their property in order for justice to be seen to be done. What do you think? Well, you know, as, as, a, as, a, as a minister, as a, as a federal government representative, um, it, me telling people what to do with their uh, their property, it really isn't, um, I would say, not necessarily appropriate. What you are seeing is a groundswell of people that um, do acknowledge that some of the lands they've held, are sometimes agricultural, sometimes residential, uh, they want to submit that to a process where they could restitute that to the um, surrounding community. There's a, a very live discussion going on with respect to burial sites uh, of former residential schools that um, through disrepair, disuse, or dispossession, have fallen into private hands and um, you know accelerating that process making sure that goes back into community hands is something that we're currently seized of and working with communities as they try to honor the children that never returned to home um, but then again taking a step back in a greater context you are seeing more people wanting to return land um, I, I have heard very few indigenous voices saying that people should be in their turn dispossessed um, the very, very much a rare or comment to hear. Um, everyone wants to live in peace and everyone realizes that no one's going anywhere, um, but they feel that um, there is some restitution and there are some repairs to be effected and they don't want to, they don't want them to take forever. Okay, Minister, let me ask you one last question. And that is, uh, of course, there was uh, an historic agreement made between the Liberals and the NDP for what looks like four years of political peace in Parliament. And I wonder whether you think that gives you the runway you need in terms of time to bring this thing to a fruitful conclusion. Yeah, I, you know, when we talk about reconciliation writ large, I think we need to acknowledge that um, this process will survive um, the Trudeau government. It will survive. Uh, it is a process that will be ongoing for some time. Um, that said, in the sh in so three years is is a, is a short time, relatively speaking. That said, when you when it comes to minority governments, um, what you often hear from Indigenous communities is the concern that you know, we'll just be replaced tomorrow and the process will have to start from scratch. So um, what I've heard time and time again is that uh, that three-year period and going having that three-year period opportunity to move on some very important pieces of, of issues in and around reconciliation um, is, uh, to use your expression, a good chunk of runway to get some stuff done, particularly with the support that we've heard and the NDP has been quite vocal on whether it's Tyler Backrick in Wet'suwet'en territory, uh, whether it's Charlie Angus, whether it's Nikki Ashton, whether it's uh, Gore Johns, uh, or, or, and, and obviously most importantly, Laurie Idlut. Um, they are very forceful advocates for Indigenous peoples, and um, I'm glad to work with them. We've been working with them, um, you know, quietly 
to get stuff done because our interests are aligned. But when it comes to, again, when it comes to reconciliation, I don't want to make this a partisan issue because it really should. Anyone that wants to run this country should have um, reconciliation on the front burner, um, whether they're conservative, green, bloc, or, or NDP. And um, uh, I'm not, again, I'm not going to make that a partisan issue, but again, having that stability is, is, is helpful for us um, so that we can provide comfort to communities that we can negotiate for a time and, and get to a point where, where uh, people feel that um, they can well serve. We look forward to having you back on the program when you have something positive and constructive to announce. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you, Steve. That's Mark Miller, Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations, MP from Ville-Marie-le-Sud-Ouest, Ile des Sœurs in Quebec. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. If it's quite new that the federal government is talking about land back, it is not new that Indigenous peoples are. With us now for some perspective on that, in the provincial capital, Pamela Palmiter, Professor and Chair in Indigenous Governance at Ryerson University, and Riley Yesno, Research Fellow at the Yellowhead Institute and a PhD student in Political Science at the University of Toronto, investigating Indigenous social movements. And it's good to have you two back on TVO tonight. Let me just start by getting... I really want to get your understanding of what you think land back means and sort of compare it to what the minister uh, thinks it means. Uh, Pamela, get us started here. What do those two words mean to you? Well, t to us, it's the same thing that it's meant since basically after contact, that it's land back, like actual land back. It's actual resources back. It's respect for our right to be self-determining. It's our children back, our women back. All of the things that Canada has tried to take from us, we just want that back. Does it mean that non-Native people are kicked out of their homes? Absolutely not, because the majority of lands in Canada are held by governments. Okay, that's a lot more than just land, so that's good to get that clarified. Mm -hmm. your, your definition of it obviously goes much beyond the simple return of land. Riley, let me get you on the record on that as well. Yeah, yeah, I would say that my definition is quite similar in the same spirit. I kind of de define land back usually as any action that centers placing jurisdiction, authority, resources back into the hands of Indigenous people. So especially those things that were harmed or taken through colonialism. Um, and like Pam said, it is more than just like... Um, it is more than just land, and it is a, something that we can chart through a long history of Indigenous contestation marked by, like, a very distinctly anti-colonial spirit. Um, mm -hmm. And so anything that you can identify that in, I think, often constitutes land back. Okay. For the moment, let us just focus on the actual land itself, though. And, Pamela, I'll, I'll pick this up with you. And, and you hinted at it in your first answer. If you are a non-Indigenous person watching this or listening to this, you may be very skeptical about how the notion of land back won't be a bad thing for you. Can you explain to that audience how this may actually be a good thing for them? Oh, it's a good thing in so many ways. So first of all, it's not taking their land or property away from them. Governments can compensate us for lands that we can't have. But it's about things like joint governance. It's about community building. It's about sharing the resources. And it's also about addressing climate change. If you think about Indigenous peoples who are on the front line trying to protect the lands from contamination and waters from being poisoned, that benefits everyone. And the way to do that is to respect and honour land back for Indigenous peoples. Riley, could you pick up on that? Is there anything you'd add? Yeah, I, I think that there's often a misunderstanding on the part of people who are skeptical of land back. One is this practical understanding that, that most of Canada is not private property. Um, so the land that we're often talking about uh, in land back is not, you know, it's not necessarily your cottage or downtown Toronto, but instead the majority of Canadian land, which is currently uh, crown land. So practically, you know, I think the picture of what land we're talking about is often misconstrued. But also, I think that there's often this very... Um, violent, misplaced logic that makes people scared to embrace land back. And that like stems from this place, I think, that in, that they think that if Indigenous people were to regain authority, were to regain jurisdiction, that we would do the same thing to them that colonizers did to us. Um, and that, you know, 
is just completely wrong. It is never the vision that Indigenous people had about living on the land together. Um, we can look at the earliest treaties, the two-row wampum belt, um, and see that there was always a vision of living together collaboratively with reciprocity, sharing in a peaceful way informed by friendship and respect. And so, you know, this logic that um, somehow it would be bad for them is, I think, a colonial myth. Maybe you could, as long as you've got the floor, Riley, just take us back, because you did touch on a bit of a history lesson there. Go back in time. How did the Crown end up being responsible for slash governing over uh, unceded territory to begin with? Take us back. Yeah, so uh, the the treaty that I mentioned is the two row wampum uh, is the two row wampum belt. Um, that's a treaty made between the Haudenosaunee and the Dutch, actually. Um, and what it, it symbolizes, though, is you'll see two beads, two rows of purple beads that represent um, the settler and the indigenous ways of knowing, of governance, of existing on the land, um, shared on the belt, and you know, in between principles of, as I mentioned, peace, friendship, and reciprocity. Um, so that was sometimes that's sometimes considered the earliest treaty between indigenous and non-indigenous people in North America. But you know, go forward about um, you know 100, 200 years in there, um, we get things like uh, the Royal Proclamation. We get things like um, the Numbered Treaties, um, and we know that oftentimes those. Um, original principles that I just described um, became abandoned on the part of settlers, became misconstrued in people's minds. Um, and when treaties, which would become, you know, the basis for a lot of the governing relations between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people were signed, um, they were deliberately, um, you know, misinterpreted, uh, that they were signed under conditions of duress, sometimes, oftentimes. And so um, we see over the course of a couple hundred years, this slow, um, this slow leaving of those original principles that, you know, could have made Canada something entirely different than what it is now. And Pamela, perhaps you could pick up the story and talk about the situations where land was, by treaty, ceded, there was an agreement, and then, if you would, sort of characterize how well or not you think those treaties are working today. I think that's one of the most important questions for Canadians to actually understand because we know there's parts of Canada where there's no treaties. We know there's parts of Canada where there are pre-Confederation treaties that don't talk about land. But the numbered treaties have always been alleged to have ceded lands. And there's treaties here in Ontario that are alleged to have ceded lands. Well, the United Nations did a study on this in the 1990s and traveled to countries all over the world with colonial governments and Indigenous populations and looked at treaties and agreements. And based on all the evidence they collected from governments and the historical record and Indigenous peoples, they came to the conclusion that there was no coming to the minds, no mutual understanding of lands being ceded. And in fact, if we were to put that before a court that was unbiased, those land session uh, portions in those treaties would not stand up to the law because there was things like undue duress, there was purposeful mistranslations, there was forced starvations, all of those things which vitiate consent in law, even back then. So, Pamela, in your view then, and again, if, a, if an unbiased, as you put it, court were to look at it today, what do you believe the state of those lands today to be? Well, I think they're all unseated. Any pre-Confederation or historical treaty, um, they are all unseated lands, which means they're Aboriginal title lands. Does that change the fact that we are in treaty relationships? Absolutely not. We work together, live together, we're intermarried, we're trying to work together on a nation-to-nation -nation basis. But in terms of whose land is it, I think there's absolutely no question in international law or Indigenous law and growing here in Canada that it's Indigenous land. All right. Riley, let me get you back in here. The minister, whom we just spoke to, says that this land ownership issue is complicated and it is not simply, because I put it to him, I said, you know, if, if, if you want to give land back, here's the deed. Give it back. And he said, well, it's a little more complicated than that. Is it more complicated than that in your view? Uh, in my view, not really. I mean, I think that the government would really like us to think that it's much more of a complex process than it is, when in fact, Indigenous people all across Turtle Island right now 
are living sovereignty. They know that they have jurisdiction and authority over their land. They are practicing their governing relations in a traditional way in many cases. We can just take Wet'suwet'en out west, an example many folks would know, for example. But so it's not a matter of like, how do we get them to do it? Indigenous people are already doing it. It's just a matter of the government respecting them doing that. And that's where it seems to get that complicated sort of narrative around it. Um, I think I, I'm very worried at this stage that the government government is going to co-opt the meaning of land back to be things like um, addition to reserve processes, um, make land claims go through the courts faster. But when it comes to, down to Indigenous people just enacting sovereignty without asking for permission, that's where we will continue to see um, violence and disrespect and um, a refusal to actually engage in meaningful nation-to-nation -nation relationships. Um, and so I think it's a lot simpler, actually, than, than perhaps Minister Miller makes it out to be. Well, okay, let me pursue that with Pamela, because, of course, you know, mm -hmm. Minister Miller is taking into account there are government departments and courts and land title and ownership and treaties and on and on and on, and First Nations that have to be negotiated with and so on. So the way he portrays it, it does sound complicated. Pamela, is it as simple as saying, this is your land, we have it now, we want to give it back to you, here it is. Is it more complicated than that? <laughs> It, not at its core. And, and that's the thing. You can make this as difficult and time intensive and expensive as you want to as a government, or you can come to the table and make do lots of things in the interim. For example, let the Wet'suwet'en Nation govern their own territory. Let the Mi'kmaq Nation govern their own territory. You can do things like exempt them from different laws. You can do things like start sharing resources right away that doesn't require any negotiations. When you're talking about which territories and where we're gonna have shared jurisdiction and exclusive jurisdiction for government, sure, that's going to be sitting down at the table and talking about that. However, there's nothing stopping them now from actually respecting the fact that it's our land and that we have the right to protect it if we want to, and that we have to, the right to have internal discussions or disagreements or work things out for ourselves if we want to. And it is as simple as that. They just choose not to. Well, okay, let me understand that better, Pamela, because you're saying there's nothing stopping them now from doing just that but it isn't happening. So something's stopping them. What do you think is stopping them? Well, we all know all of this has been very much politicized and they cater very much. Keep in mind, this is about politics. This is also about elections and they carry very much to massive transnational corporations who believe they have interests in our territories, who are making tons of money off our territories. It's also about the different politics across the country, their voter base, whether that would ring favorably or not. All of the considerations that are in fact not relevant to uh, an idea of land back and what they could do right now. And I think it's also very important for our viewers to understand that Canada has now declared that the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is applicable law in Canada. That protects our rights to govern all of our traditional lands and resources. So the minimum standard now has been raised and Canada's just a little bit slow on the draw to get to it. Yeah, Roddy, can you pick up on that? Undri Canada has signed on to UNDRIP. Uh, what, what does that obligate the government of Canada to do that, in your view, it is not yet doing? Yeah, I mean, so UNDRIP is a little bit out of my realm of expertise. However, um, from my understanding, it's exactly what Pam was just talking about, right? Like about um, ensuring our rights, making sure that in, a, in the most global of senses that it's understood that we have a right to govern ourselves, we have a right to live good lives on our territory, we have a right um, to, to be authorities over our own lands and our resources, whether we do or do not want to engage in resource extraction processes, et cetera. Um, um, and those are um, those are all conditions that are repeatedly violated by the Canadian state, by the Canadian government. Um, we can see it in Wet'suwet'en. We can see it at 1492 Land Back Lane, um, repeatedly throughout history. And even after the point where Canada was supposed to accept UNDRIP, do they continue to renege on those obligations? Um, so 
um, that would make that uh, land back actually falls very, very nicely into what UNDRIP is trying to secure for Indigenous people. I should actually get off this path right now because we've got another guest coming up right after you two who will speak to the UNDRIP situation. So uh, I'm going to hold off on that for now and, and pursue that more with our next guest. But Pamela, tell me this. I do hear anecdotes from time to time about, for example, um, non-Indigenous Canadians saying that when they die, they will... Uh, in their will, pass on, for example, their cottages to the local First Nations as a way of uh, as a way of making land back truly happen, uh, if not necessarily in their lifetime, but then at some point uh, in the life of the community. Uh, I hear that anecdotally. How much of that is going on, actually? Actually, I've actually seen it happen in different places across the country. I get contacted by private citizens and businesses who hold land saying, what do I do? I have this land, some of which I want to give land back to the local First Nation now, some of which I could bequeath in my will or when the lease is up or all of these other things. And I always direct them to the local First Nation. And I think that's key that you brought that up, Steve, because everybody is involved in making reparations for generations of genocide and the benefit that settlers have had, does that mean that they should give away all their land? No, of course not. Nobody's asking for that. No one's trying to push them out of any resource industries or anything else. This is just about fairness and what can you do? And some people have lots of plots of land. There's businesses who have unused land. It's such an easy thing to do in the here and now. So, Riley, if, if you are a non-Indigenous Canadian and you are watching or listening to this and you think maybe government is dragging its feet a little too much on this, this is a real option, in your view, for non-Indigenous Canadians to take. Have I got that right? Certainly, yes. And it, it doesn't have to just be, you know, um, the bequeathing of land. Um, because I think that oftentimes when we think of it like that, it can become, uh, you know, a project that's only uh, available to like to the elite or to wealthy folks. Um, but every single person has a role to play in land back. And so that could be, yes, doing something physical like the return of land or, you know, making monthly donations to land trusts, which do exist all across uh, Turtle Island as well. Um, but there are other things you can do right like when indigenous people in your communities in your proximity are fighting for a assertion of their rights you can show up physically with your time with your vote um you can show up and just do something as simple as like pass out signs and keep the fire going. And that allows Indigenous land defenders to continue doing their work. When you go onto Indigenous territories, you can un know and understand and follow their rules of law just as you do the Canadian rules of law. That is affirming and legitimizing Indigenous people as, you know, the, the govern, uh, governing authorities of their land. Um, and so it can be those everyday sort of actions as opposed to also these grand gestures, which, you know, are, are welcome but aren't necessarily accessible to every person. Gotcha. All right. We've got a few minutes left here, and we have talked a lot about specifically land back so far. But, Pamela, in your first answer, you did touch on the fact that land back, in your understanding of that term, goes much beyond that. And I wonder if you could pick up the story there. Beyond specifically the land, what else would you like to see happen? Go over to you on beyond the actual land. Okay. In addition to land, it also means resources back. Think about the vast natural resources all over the country, but not just natural resources, because not all Indigenous peoples want to extract natural resources like it's been done right now. It's also about the massive wealth that's been generated all over our territories. So a fair share of taxes, fees, license, permits, like all of those things that royalties, everything, all the wealth that's generated and collected on our territories, especially from governments, a fair share needs to go to First Nation governments from whose those lands are being shared. And that is part of making sure that we have the wealth from our own territories to make our nation sustainable. And, and that's, that's literally critical going forward. It doesn't change anything for non-Indigenous peoples. This is about government saying, yes, of all of these taxes, First Nations get a share of all of these things, plus any other wealth that's generated. Just out of curiosity, Pamela, if negotiations are ongoing, 
How do you, I don't know if you've got spies in the room or not, but how do you keep up to date with, with where things are at? Well, I work with a lot of First Nations all across the country, and obviously First Nations advisors and lawyers and things like that. And we know that although Canada says things like, oh, yes, we want to do land back, and yes, we're changing the land claim process, at the heart of what they're doing is trying to get First Nations to cede, surrender, and extinguish all of their rights to their territories and their resources in exchange for a package so that you're no longer the true governor over the territory or your resources, but you're getting something back from Canada, obviously, which is far less. And they've tried to change the wording to say, oh, we don't do that anymore, but they do. They make you sign the agreement, and in the, in, in the event that you don't follow this agreement, you've ceded and surrendered and extinguished your rights. And, and that's a fundamental problem with the current negotiations. Hmm. Riley, let me just finish up with you on this. And that is, I'm going to put an analogy to you, and I want you to tell me whether this makes sense or not, whether the analogy works in this case. And I'm going to pluck something out of the not-too-long-ago history and, and go to South Africa in doing so. And I want to know whether you think if there were the possibility of land back and a genuine agreement with the government of Canada, which, which left both sides coming away from the table satisfied, would you put that as akin to the end of apartheid in South Africa? Would it be something that significant? Yeah, well, and I mean, it's. Uh, I always think South Africa, African comparisons are, are uh, illuminating because, you know, the model for apartheid in uh, South Africa was actually built off of the Indian Act, um, which is still a piece of Canadian legislation today. Um, and so I, I think that it would at least be, you know, a necessary component um, of ending the ongoing dispossession and oppression and genocide of Indigenous people in the country. You cannot end a genocide against Indigenous people without returning their capacity, their authority, their legitimacy to them. And so, or sorry, Canada cannot return legitimacy to Indigenous people. They already have it. But, you know, affirming that and respecting it. Um, and so, yes, I do think it would be um, a, a, an essential part of that project. Gotcha. Pamela Palmiter and Riley Yesno, who still has, in my view, the best Twitter handle ever. Yes, no, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> that is the best. I want to thank both of you for coming on to TVO tonight and sharing your views on this. It's been very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you much. Transferring property from one owner to another is a simple matter in Canadian law. Returning land that was never ceded or that's currently privately held is quite another matter. With us now for the legal perspective on land back in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Brenda Gunn, academic and research director at the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. She's a professor at the University of Manitoba's Faculty of Law. And Brenda, it's good to have you on our program. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me. Not at all. Let's talk about the logistics of land back. Do you think Canada's laws are sufficiently non-colonial, if I can put it that way, in order to, you know, make this work? Well, you know, I think a lot of the solution that we need going forward is not for Canadian law to solve this problem, but rather for Canadian law just to simply get out of the way and recognize Indigenous people's own laws, customs and traditions in relation to land. So I'm, I'm not sure if Canadian law can be anything but colonial, but I think we can ensure that there's space within the Canadian legal landscape to ensure that Indigenous peoples can continue to exercise authority over their lands. Do you think it has a track record, Canadian law that is, does it have a track record of being able to, as you put it, get out of the way and recognize other types of law? Well, we do have a few examples in Canada. Canada is a really interesting country because of the fact we have two very different legal systems that currently operate within it. The majority of Canada operates under the British common law system of law that follows the precedence of courts. But we also have in Quebec a completely different situation and they follow the civil code. And this form of law is very different 
I've been trained in the British common law and that's the legal system that I understand. And I have no ability to practice in Quebec or understand how that legal system works. And that's fine, right? There's no problems that generally have come up over the last 150 years in Canada where we haven't been able to work that out. So I guess I feel like if Canada can be unique and have two very different legal systems operating, it's not that hard for us to recognize the space for Indigenous people's laws. And I guess I should specifically note, Indigenous laws have continued to operate. They just always haven't been fully recognized by Canadian law. So Canadian law can walk and chew gum at the same time. <laughs> I, I hope so. We, we've done it. And so we're only asking for Canadian law to continue to exercise that flexibility and recognize the space of Indigenous laws. Gotcha. You mentioned the UK tradition that, that uh, much of the country is based in right now. So let me follow up on that, because the notion of, of different types of ownership in England, for example, uh, is a precedent for us here. The Crown has long-term lease agreements on some land and some ho home ownership, which means that certain lands might revert back to the crown after a particular period of time, say 100 years or something. Is that a template for what could transpire as it relates to Indigenous law in Canada? Well, you know, I think we should be open to all sorts of options and opportunities in Canada to address the situation that we have. But we also must remember in many parts of Canada, we also have treaties that guide the relationship. And so, you know, I, I'm not sure if we want to have land reverting back or if we want to come back to some of these historic treaties. I, for example, am sitting on Treaty 1 territory in Winnipeg, Manitoba, and that treaty was about land sharing. And so I think a lot of what we need to do as we think of solutions is also to come back to the promises and arrangements that were made at the time that Canada was setting up the state and think about how can we fulfill those promises that were made in the 18 and 1900s and earlier and have those uh, be recognized today. I take your point on that, but, but uh, and let me give you the most famous example and you tell me what you think. I mean, you can't give downtown Toronto back. You can't give downtown Ottawa back. It's too complicated. It's too difficult. What, what, I mean, we're going to get into the weeds a bit here, but what could you do short of doing that that Indigenous people would consider to be fair compensation, fair trade, uh, mission accomplished? You know, I, I don't know. Is it really too complicated to give Toronto back? Maybe. But... Is there a way we can recognize in a really fulsome way that Toronto is Indigenous land? Is there a way for us to really reconceptualize Canada as an Indigenous land where we really start to think about the space that Indigenous peoples belong, right? And, and where we continue to have responsibilities over. I think there's a lot of opportunities that exist even within large urban centers to recognize and um, really share the space and live together in a better way. So, you know, whether it be the small examples that I know of in Toronto, where some of the, na the street names, you were trying to revitalize Indigenous naming for places. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of what I see in urban centers, it's not necessarily just about changing the legal ownership of land, but recognizing Indigenous people's rights to those lands and that obligation that many Indigenous peoples feel to the lands and think about how can we ensure that Indigenous peoples continue to be involved in caring for the land and making decisions for the land. Well, every time somebody says the word Toronto or Ottawa, I mean, those are Indigenous words, right? So we, we, we certainly are aware of the fact that Indigenous people do have and have had claim to this area and the nation's capital for hundreds and hundreds of years. I mean, going beyond that, how, how, how would we compensate for treaties that have failed so far to be implemented and followed through on? What should we do? Well, you know, I think there's lots of examples. In Manitoba, for example, where we've had the historic treaties, 
there have been certain promises made, including setting aside certain lands specifically for Indigenous peoples' use. And, you know, even some of those basic promises haven't been fulfilled. And so when federal land, for example, becomes available in an urban center, in Winnipeg, we had the example of the Capion Barracks, you know, there's room and opportunity, even within urban centers, to have urban reserves and to have spaces where Indigenous peoples can continue to gather and exercise both their cultural traditions, but also engage in various forms of economic development. Well, let me do another example from something here in the provincial capital. I mean, there's Downsview. There is land in Downsview that the federal government has owned for decades and decades and decades, and whatever was originally going on there isn't going on there anymore, and there have been numerous examples of what to do with that land. Are you saying that one of the options ought to be giving some of that land to Indigenous people, and they take it over, they own it, they do what they want there? That absolutely should be a consideration. And... You know, I, I, I no longer have uh, attachment to Toronto. I no longer live there. But I would say, why not talk to the First Nations around there? Is there an interest in that? Is there opportunities? Is it a good investment for them to undertake responsibility and legal ownership of the land? And it should definitely be part of our conversation. It doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, land back doesn't necessarily have to be Toronto, and we, we need to be more open-minded. We can't sort of go through the country and start saying, well, we can't talk about this area, we can't talk about this area, and, and take them off the board altogether. But we can be more nuanced and, and think more broadly on, okay, Toronto is complicated, so how do we start addressing it? And the lands that you refer to in Dance View could be a starting point for that conversation. If nuance is required, does that suggest that expropriation by the government of Canada on behalf of fulfilling its treaty obligations should be off the table? You know, it's, it's hard to speak in large generalities. What I can say is for the work that I've done in the First Nations and Indigenous communities that I've worked with, I haven't heard a lot of them asking for people's private home back. That's not really the goal. I mean, Indigenous peoples have experienced dispossession for hundreds of years. They know what it's like to lose their home. I don't see a lot of First Nations asking to put other people in that situation. But again, if we're talking expropriation, there's all sorts of federal and provincial lands in cities and in urban centers that you know, aren't being put to use. Or we could think about shared ownership or transferring ownership. So again, I think it's not that expropriation should be on or off the table necessarily, but looking at what are the aspirations of Indigenous peoples and think about how can we work within current ownership and create new opportunities to really recognize the deep connection that Indigenous peoples feel to the land and that is central to their cultural and physical survival. Well, let me pick up on that. And we touched on this in the last segment, but, but you really are the expert in this. So I want to follow up with you on it. And that is UNDRIP, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples which Canada has signed on to. We are a signatory to that. So we are presumably obligated uh, to fulfill the obligations that are a part of that. Can you help us understand how land back and fulfilling the obligations in UNDRIP, what the relationship is there? Excellent. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about the UN Declaration. It is something I spend a lot of my time thinking about. So the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, from my perspective, at its heart, is about shifting the relationship from a colonial one, where the government controls all aspects of Indigenous peoples' lives, to a new relationship based on mutual respect and partnership that is grounded in Indigenous peoples' rights to self-determination. And when you go through and look at the UN Declaration, you see many references to Indigenous peoples' own customs, laws, and traditions. You see provisions that are related to Indigenous peoples' rights to their lands, territories, and resources. And interestingly, when you look at those provisions specifically in relation to land, 
the provisions are not just about owning and controlling and using the land, the sort of Western economic based perspective on lands, but there's also a provision about strengthening Indigenous people's relationship to land. And so when we're looking at the current situation in Canada, we really should be mindful of the fact that Indigenous, for many Indigenous peoples, at least where I come from in, in, in the part of the country that I reside and know most, Indigenous peoples have a strong connection to that land. They see the land and the resources as, as family, as relations, deep responsibilities for the land. The language and their way of knowing and thinking comes from the land. And so given the centrality of land to Indigenous peoples knowing who they are and continuing to exist as distinct people, it's really important in Canada that we find ways to ensure that Indigenous peoples can continue to strengthen that relationship. And so for me, the UN Declaration in this work of land back in reconciliation is really critical because it reminds the Canadian government that yes, they are a colonial government. They asserted control in a way that hopefully we would find no longer acceptable. And so the UN Declaration really provides us a way forward while it recognizes the injustices and the human rights violations of removing Indigenous peoples from their land. It's really about how do we move forward. And so I think there is a strong obligation on Canada to begin to implement the UN Declaration. And that includes Indigenous people, the rights that Indigenous peoples have to their traditional lands, territories and resources. We will continue to watch this with fascination, and we're grateful to you for your time in helping us understand it better. Brenda Gunn from the University of Manitoba, thanks for joining us on TVO tonight. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. And that is the agenda for Monday, March 28th, 2022. Tomorrow, can Canada's oil and gas sector help reduce the world's reliance on Russian fossil fuels? We'll explore that. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.